Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining me on today's webinar, Negotiation, uh, Learning the Basics. My name is Jason Butler, and I'm the Head of Financial Education here at Salary Finance. Um, if you're not aware, Salary Finance is an employee benefit available to you, and we're on a mission to get people out of debt and into saving. And we offer a range of products, including things like affordable loans, which are repaid through your salary, as well as the ability to save money directly from your wage as well and get advances of pay. Now, just before we get into the main presentation, I just need to make it very clear that the content you're about to hear is educational and generic in nature, and it shouldn't be construed as personal financial advice. So if you need help, either contact your Citizens Advice Bureau and ask to speak to uh, a money coach or advisor who can give you personal help on sort of debt uh, management and budgeting. Or if your needs are a little bit more involved, then please feel free to contact a regulated independent advice uh, advisor or advice firm if you require personalized financial advice. OK, so let's get cracking then. So what are we going to cover today? Um, we've only got 30 minutes. so I'm going to give you a, a whistle stop tour, an overview of a very, very uh, much misunderstood skill, which is not often taught. We're going to talk about why negotiating matters. Uh, we'll talk about the three components of negotiating. We'll walk through the basic approach to negotiating. Uh, we'll touch on a summary of some of the other areas that it can apply to. And I want to leave as much time as possible for questions. Now, obviously, there's a limit to how much time I can spend, but I want to try and answer as many questions as possible, specific questions you've got. This, this is about your time. We'll be done within 30 minutes. And if I can't get to your question, we will answer those questions in written format after the event. OK, so let's dive into this. So um, before we get cracking into the main presentation, I just want to take stock of where you feel you are in negotiating. So first of all, do you find it? Are you terrible, um, not very good, uh, fair, quite good or excellent? So I'm just going to launch the poll. Please answer that honest, honestly, as honest as you can. And let's just see where we are, the state of the nation, as it were. Right, you've got another couple of seconds. Vote away. Five, four, three, two, one. OK, so most of you, the vast majority of you feel you're either terrible, not very good or fair. There's only 12 percent of you who think that you're very, very good. So that's good. Look, here's the thing. You're not on your own. No one gets taught how to negotiate. A few very small number of people have a natural ability to negotiate, but most of us have to learn on the job going through life. OK, so let's just think about why we find it so hard to negotiate. And it really it boils down to it boils down to a number of things, really, is that, first of all, money is a taboo. Um, and for many people talking about money, discussing money, it's a very, very unpleasant thing that most people find very, very uncomfortable thing to deal with. Um, whole host of issues there, but and 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 it could be because you know we find it scary, we find it painful. Money represents complexity. Uh, it's something that's abstract. And um, about 50% of the UK population, and this is similar uh, in different parts of the world, find uh, numeracy and dealing with numbers um, challenging. Their basic literally uh, financial literacy is quite poor. But look, don't don't beat yourself up on that. Even if you weren't good at maths at school, you can still be a good negotiator. And we're going to help equip you with the, the basic framework so you can take uh, take a, the next step. There is also, I think, in popular media, there is a, a perception, I think, that that negotiation is a bit shady. It's about if I win, you lose or somehow you're going to cause um, adversity or it's uh, it's something that only gangsters do or people who are, you can't really trust that somehow um, it affects your integrity as a person. And I think some of us think that a negotiation is, is almost like a battle. It's like a battle of the wills that we're, you know, I've got to beat you into submission and you are going to give it all up. Well, that is not what a negotiation um, um, is negotiation in very simple terms is where you have a full and frank dialogue with someone where you have an outcome which is acceptable and reasonable to both of you now negotiation is all about finding out you know where their common ground lies uh, just one thing here this is not about being fair this is not about being a lovely person 
And it's not about being a nasty person or being a brute. It's just about confronting situations as you see them. And I've got someone put their hand up, what, what we've got here. Um, can everyone see the screen? People can hear me? It must be on your end because there's nothing here. So I'll carry on unless there's a, there's a big problem there. OK. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah? No? One? Yeah. OK. So let's look. There are three key elements to negotiation. Oh, hang on. We've got someone else asking. Just let me just check. You can all see, hear everything. Yes, you can see the screen. Thank you. All right. So there are three key elements there uh, of a negotiation. There's first of all information. Then there's patience, and there are having options. Okay. And what that really means is the person who has the most information will do better than the person who doesn't have information. So you need to know as much about your, the person you're negotiating with as possible. And we'll come on to that in a minute. I'm going to give you a real example of where I purchased a car and how the information helped me. You also have to be patient. The person who has the most patience will get the best deal. If you're in a hurry to buy or sell anything or conclude a deal, the chances are you're going to give up ground. And if you don't have other options, I mean, I know this is all very relevant, isn't it, to the Brexit negotiations, but if you don't have other options, you can't walk away, you can't do something else, then um, you're gonna, it's going to be very difficult for you to, um, to um, you know, have the best, best result. Now, let's just move into that in a bit more detail. OK, so let's talk about um, let's talk about salary for a minute. This is the classic old one. Now, I know some people are in this uh, in the uh, uh, public sector. I think it's, it's difficult for them, but it, it works in any sector here. When it comes to negotiating the salary, there are a couple of things that you need to think of. First of all, you have to choose the right time. You, you know, don't go and ask to, whoever the person is who you've got to ask or the person who's responsible for your salary um, recommendations. Don't ask them when they've the, the month end or they've just had terrible news or they're massively overworked. You've got to choose your time right. You want to find them in a good mood when things have gone right and you've had, uh, a, you know, a good run of things. The thing you've got to do when you do get the time to talk to uh, the person who you're negotiating your, your salary with or your overall package is you've got to restate your achievements and value. Now, here's a point. If you aren't achieving and if you aren't delivering and somehow you are, um, you know, you're not really cutting the mustard, then there is no point in you going to ask for a salary rise because you're coming at it from the wrong perspective. But in all negotiations, there has to be fair, there has to be a fair exchange. You have to be on solid ground. And if you aren't achieving and delivering value, then you have to rework your career or your job until you are. Um, never go first. I um, mean, you know, I know there's stories that says you go first and anchor them and tell them you want an enormous sum and then they've got to come down. Well, the chances are they may give you the figure you want. And if you go first and going too low, it may be that actually what happens is you don't get as much as you could have got. Um, so let them go first. They might have an idea. The other thing is to define a good outcome from the raise. Now, what I mean from that is 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 what needs to happen for it to be good for you and for them. So if for them it means that you stay motivated, you're going to stay in the post, you're going to do some extra, uh, take on some more responsibilities, that's great. From their point of view, they don't want an unhappy member of staff who's not delivering or thinking about leaving. And the other thing to do is do your research. So actually refer to the research. And, and, and if you say, look, you know, I've looked at my role that I'm doing. So whether you're in a public or private sector, do your research and with online research tools now you can easily find out what other people of your age and your experience are doing and uh, there was a thing I heard the other day on Moneybox Radio 4 where a lady said that she did some research and found out that uh, she was being underpaid relative to male colleagues by you know a good couple of thousand pounds who was actually less experienced and less qualified than her and she then went and laid it on the line uh, not mentioning who the colleague was so do your research now, here's a good thing. If you state a salary range of my type of role with some of my kind of experience and my capabilities typically commands a salary of X to Y or a package of X to Y, by giving a range, you give your boss or your, the person you're negotiating with, you give them, you give them some wriggle room, you give them some uh, a landing space where if you just go in and say, I want 32,000. And, and they say, well, I can't really do that. If you go in and say, you know, what I'm looking for is somewhere between 29 and 33, then that will help them. That will help the discussion. It gives them some wriggle room. Now, you don't have to say whether you're expecting at the top end of the range or the bottom end of the range. And here's another thing. Always end your numbers. 
uh, don't make them exact. So you notice there I've got 29,250 and 34,780. That sounds very precise and it really adds credibility to the fact that you've done the research. So just putting 29,000 and 34,000 or 30,000 and 35 just sounds like you've made the numbers up. You just rounded it up. So it's a psychological principle. Here's another th interesting thing. Pivot to non-financial terms. So this thing about being pleasantly persistent, if you're trying to get a pay rise or an increase in your package or more share options or whatever it is, just keep on saying, OK, well, what is it you can do in terms of extra holiday? What is it you can do in terms of extra training? What is it you can do? So just keep on and on so that they know that you're not really going to back down from wanting more. And actually, you might find that them giving you some extra salary is actually easier that are actually giving you more holiday or giving you more training or giving you other things. So by using non-financial terms, what you're doing is you're giving you again, you're, you're giving the negotiation additional ways to go. And it's probably a good chance that they're going to come back to salary. But if they don't come back to salary, you have to be comfortable with the non-financial terms. So you might say, OK, well, what about additional pension contributions? Will you give me um, the employer's national insurance back if I put more of my earnings in? What about um, what about a different bonus system? So always, you know, just constantly try and throw other things in that make giving you the salary actually the easier option. And the final thing here is to believe in yourself. If you do not value yourself, and that's not the same as being arrogant and, and, and bulky, but believing in yourself, you must believe in yourself for your boss or for anyone who employs you. No one is going to, no one is going to um, believe in you more than you. Uh, and a quick story there is that my father and my late father-in-law's best friend as a chap who did enamel gold sort of stuff, he 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 did enameling of, of of precious metals on things. A very skilled job, and he did the job for about forty years. And his clients always—he was self-employed—and his clients were always always whinging about the price and the cost and everything. And he never felt able to ask them for more money. And when he finally retired, they begged him. They said they would double. They would pay double what the uh, other people were, were charging they would pay double to get him to do the work because they valued it so much but it took him to get to he was 68 before they actually realized he'd been undercharging for years so again um, if you've got to believe in yourself okay let's talk about buying and selling a house now let's talk about buying a house because probably a lot of you um, um, may well be thinking of buying a house and and if you haven't already got a house you'll probably have to sell one now the thing about buying and selling a house if, if you're buying a house if you make an offer for a house, the agent is legally obliged to put your offer forward to the vendor. Most people don't know this. They are. It's the law. If you make a proper bona fide um, offer for a house and you can prove that you've got the funding, which means you might need to show your savings account and a mortgage offer in principle, they must put that offer to the seller, the vendor. Most people don't know this. Now, here's the thing. In the current environment, House prices are static, if not falling. In some areas of the country, they're falling. Other areas, they're static. Very small areas, they may be going up. But on balance, it's a it's a basically a buyer's market. Um, and so therefore, if you're a buyer, you are a valuable commodity. And you need to realize that. And don't fall for all the games that the estate agents, they're not your friends. They're not working for you. They're working for the seller. All they're interested in is a sell. That's all they're interested in. So all this about you've got to run quickly. Remember what we said, information patience and options you don't have to rush right you need to know why the person is selling are they under pressure what's their situation and you don't have to go to the mortgage advisor of the, of the estate agent show your inside inside leg measurement if you've got a mortgage offer in principle and prove you've got the deposit that's all they need and this thing about saying you've got to see their mortgage advisor don't wear for it just tell them to clear off you're not interested and as long as you can prove you're a, you're a proper buyer and you've got a mortgage offer in principle and and i would suggest it's very difficult to buy a beautiful property on the cheap but you can buy a lovely property for reasonable price and the property you can see there, it's my house. And I bought that house 21 years ago. Um, I didn't get it from, I didn't get it for a steal. I paid a reasonable price. Uh, in fact, I actually paid 10,000 pounds over the asking price. But in, in retrospect, it was, it was money well spent. But for most houses that are a commodity where there is lots of others like it, whether it's a flat, a house or, or, or whatever, you should be thinking of offering at least 20% below the asking price as long as you, you can prove you've got the means to buy it. And it certainly compare the price to if you were renting. So um, 
basically you've got to say to yourself if i was to rent that property and let's assume someone wants a five percent yield work the price out on the basis if if you were to rent it and the person was to get a five percent yield on the rental property that's just a rough idea if you're selling right you've got to basically make sure that you aren't in a hurry so for instance i would never personally sell a house in a chain I've always bought and sold houses. I bought several properties. I've never been in a chain ever. I've always sold, moved into rented, then bought because it shows you're serious. It shows you can move quickly and you're not you're not at the mercy of someone else. I know it's not always practical, but try and avoid being in a chain because it shows you're serious. Um, and here's the other thing is that if you've got to take a bit of a, a, a a bit of a cut on the house you're selling if you're buying a bigger house you're probably going to take a, that you're probably going to be paying less there so you have to be sanguine about it so they're just some things on 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 houses there but the other thing about housing remember is that the person who owns it is actually owning a liability and maintenance and every month that goes by that you don't own it you're avoiding having to make the property good and and i would always suggest to you that if particularly if it's an older property you've got to assume you're going to have to spend a good 10 percent of whatever you pay for that house to bring it up to the standard sometimes more sometimes a bit less now let's talk about buying a, a, anything really but i want to tell you the story about me buying a car because this this really illustrates the principles of a negotiation I wanted to buy a new car, not a new car, a second hand car. Um, um, here's the thing. Buying a new car is just a, is a way of losing money very quickly. And most people, 80 percent of people buy it on finance. So buying a depreciating asset on a finance contract is total and utter madness. Let me say that again. It's total and utter madness. So you need to think about um, buying a car with the money you've got and then saving money until you can afford a bigger car because cars keep going down in value. But let's tell you the story. I wanted to buy an E-Class Mercedes, two years old. I knew exactly what I wanted. I did all my research and I worked out there was a range of cars from anything from 18,000 to 30,000. So I could afford that, uh, anything in that range, but I wanted to pay less, not more. So I had options, right? I had the information. I did all my research. I knew what they were going for. And then I found a car on sale for a private individual now i asked him i phoned him he sent me a video of the car i asked him why he was selling it he said he bought a van that he's converting into a camper van very nice chap owned it from new uh, very genuine um the video looked fantastic it was in good condition uh, but it was due to have a service and i said to him uh he had it up for twenty four thousand. i said i'll give you nineteen thousand because that's what we buy car.com said they would pay for it and they always you know pay a bit less so then I basically um, said to him, OK, well, I've got 19,000 for it. Bear in mind, he's asking 24. Um, and he said, crikey, no, I can't take anything less than 23. I said, no, and I totally understand that you need to get the most money you can for your car, for you, your family. I get all that. Totally understand, totally respect it. And I do the same. So what have I done there? I've acknowledged, I've shown empathy, I've, I've shown respect. I've not tried to have a battle. I've just said, but I've only got 19,000 for it. Look, why don't you keep it on the market for sale? see how you go and if it's still on the market in three weeks time i'll get in touch with you again so what's happening now i've got options i didn't have to rush he knows i've anchored him at a lower figure he knows i'm serious i've shown respect he he's got nothing to lose because he's still got it on the market now my view was if he sold it i'd lose the opportunity fine i'll look for another one there was, there was loads of loads of them around i quite like this one but i'd rather pay nineteen thousand than thirty thousand. Three weeks go by he's still got the car for sale so now what do i know I know that he needs to sell it because he's got this new car. I've subsequently found out that he's got finance on it because he let that slip. So I know every month that's going by, he's paying finance charges. And he knows and I know that he still hasn't sold it after three months, so I, uh, three weeks. So I now have more, more information. I've got options. I've said to him, I see you haven't sold it. He said, the lowest I can take is 22,000. I said, the most I've got is 20,000. OK, so suddenly we're starting to get a bit nearer. I'm not probably going to get it for the 19. He's now starting to realize he won't get 22. I said, he said, well, we're too far apart. I said, fine, look, totally respect it. Leave another couple of weeks. I said, if you haven't sold it in a couple of weeks, I'll come back and we'll have another chat. When we came back in two weeks time, he still hadn't sold it. I said, right, I'll give you 20,000 pounds and I'll buy the car. He said, no, I, I can't accept less than 21,000. And I said to him, OK, have you had the two year service done? He said, no. I said, right, well, that could cost me six or seven hundred thousand, uh, six, six or seven hundred pounds. I'll give you 20,000. I'll take the risk of that. Do you want the money? And I can be with you in two days. So what's now happened? 
He he. I'm introducing more information, which is that he needs a service. He's he knows it's been four or five weeks since I first looked at it. He's still got payments going out, and I've said to him I can be with him in two days, and it can all be taken care of. I ended up buying that car for twenty thousand pounds. I collected it two days later, and I'm happy as Larry. So that's a true life example. So the reality about uh, about negotiation is it's not a battle. OK, and you might think the odds are stacked against you. But if you approach in a business like in a polite, in a friendly, in a human way, respecting the fact that someone else wants to get the best result, the best result for him was to get that car out of his life because he's still got monthly payments. And because I could be flexible and as I had more information, I was able to discuss with him and let him feel in control. But ultimately, I got the car for the price that I wanted. It wasn't 19, but it's 20. And I'm still happy that it's three or four thousand less than it would have been on a forecourt. But there are other areas that you can negotiate. You, utilities and suppliers, you know, ring up your utility supplier and say you're not interested. You know, what can they do? Um, you're thinking of leaving. Um, you'd be surprised. Mobile phones, uh, electric, gas, broadband, all of them will negotiate with you and ask to speak to the retentions unit. Your mortgage and other borrowing. Now, this is an interesting one. Your existing mortgage lender, you might have now more equity in your property because it's gone up in value or, and or you've paid down the loan. And you might qualify without having to pay any fees or illegals or anything for a lower rate just by asking and say to them, well, if they can't offer you what you're looking for, then you're going to have to move. OK. And when you go to think about a new mortgage, um, think about using try and play different providers off against each other. Get a broker on the scene and try and negotiate a better deal. Fines and penalties. Um, it's a difficult area, this, but um, don't just pay fines when they come in. Always, always, always uh, appeal the fine and put mitigating circumstances if you generally have. Um, because most of the time, you know, there's a good chance, uh, 30 or 40% of the times they're finding your favor. And products and services, any products and service can, can be negotiated. I mean, at the end of the day, if you've got someone who's been doing work for you um, and um, you know they want to put the price up, um, that's fine. But what you then got to say is what else can you do? I, I, if you're going to put your prices up, what else can you do to make it easier for me? So whether you're supplying or you're buying, always, always come up with some sort of counter offer and ask the other person a question. Well, what can you do to make that easier for me to say yes? What can you do to make that more palatable? And um, and complain. Simple as that. OK, now um, I've given you the overview. Um, I want to know if we've got any questions here. Um, so uh, far away. Let's have a look and see what we've got. Any questions? OK, right. So right, this first one here. OK, um, I get anxious when I talk about money and my mouth goes dry and I find it difficult to have a conversation. What can I do? Well. I liken this to public speaking, and that's from uh, Nicola. Yeah. So I liken this, Nicola, to public speaking, right? So most people, if they were to go and go and speak in front of a, an audience, they would be anxious, wouldn't they? Because they're worried about being judged, or they're worried about a bad outcome, or they're worried about something not going right, or whatever. Um, so I think the way to do it is to rehearse it. Get a friend to rehearse. So if you're whatever you're going to go and negotiate, whatever conversation you're going to have about money. And particularly in negotiations, get a friend or a colleague to um, to um, to just sort of work it through if you role play it. And if you role play it, um, there's a good chance that you're going to be better when it comes to the actual um, the actual big day. So and also make sure you have lubricated your your mouth with room temperature water because just a little bit of water would be fine. OK, right. We've got some more questions. There's so many. Let's have a look now. Uh, yes, I will be providing um, um, some reading material in a minute, uh, uh, suggested reading material, and we can give access to the slides. Yes. Um, how, uh, when buying a house, how do you deal with the other potential buyers who are interested or put in their offers? Um, well, you don't. Look, here's the thing. There are loads of houses. That's from um, someone called Kay. Uh, well, Kay, there are lots of houses. OK, there's never never get emotionally invested in the house. There's always another one. It's a bit like partners. You might find the love of your life and they leave you, but there's always going to be someone else who you can love. So there's always going to be another house. It doesn't really matter what other people are doing. It matters what you're doing. And if someone else wants to be an idiot and offer more, let them do it. Right. Be relaxed about rushing in. And remember, the agent wants to one, get a deal and two, get the highest price. Is, this one is from Richard. Is negotiating easier depending on which country and culture you come from? Well, 
look, I, I, it's like anything. Different cultures do have different things. Perhaps in America, they're a bit, a bit more open about it. Uh, in India and Asia, there is a bit more of a hierarchy about age, etc. But look, here's the thing. If you don't ask, if you don't open into a conversation, some cultures, they don't respect you if you don't negotiate. And I don't just mean buying trinkets from the side of the road. I mean, they, they expect you to come in and ask. As long as you do it in a polite and respectful way and you actually begin with the end in mind. So here's another thing. Be clear in your own mind, Richard, what the good outcome is. What is a good outcome? Let's have a look one here. This one's from Sally. Car insurance. Is it best to get several comparable quotes and then haggle with existing provider? Find it difficult to think of counter arguments in advance of all the things they might say to persuade me to stay with them. Well, uh, yes. Yes, obviously, that's all about what we said. Get information. Do your research. Remember the three things we said? Options, patience, information. You can't go in to a car insurance provider without having proper information. And it's the same with utility provider. I mean, I've just I've just changed my utility provider and it saved me two hundred and fifty pound for the year. Right, company car lease. What's the key to look out for when entering the lease? Right, company car, or do you mean personal? That's from Mr. Curry. Does that mean um, well, look, company car leases? That's down to your company. That's nothing you can think. I think you're probably thinking there, Mr. Curry. You're thinking. Uh, personal leases. I, I would strongly recommend that you do not buy cars on personal leases. OK, they're a big con. It's the biggest con. Just don't do it. So but if you are having to do it, um, I would I would I would probably go to um, some different dealers, but also go online because there are some uh, companies that will fund them completely separate from the dealer. And then what you can do to the dealer is say, can you match this online quote I've got? Because there's plenty of companies that will sell your car on a personal lease. Uh, if you really will go for one, fine. OK, um, Lauren, Lauren says, isn't there a risk of wasting lots of money on rent and getting tied into a renting contract that restricts your ability to move fast? Well, most rent contracts is a six month situation. Um, I agree. Um, Look at it this way. If you were buying, say, a house for £200,000 and you were renting somewhere for £700 and let's say you did a six month, uh, you did a six month contract and you were fully intending to buy a house. If you have to walk away from that house um, after four months because you found the house and you've completed and purchased it, you're only going to do another two lots of £600. Look at that as part of the price of buying the house. So, yes, you could you could waste some money on rent. But if you look at it in the totality of buying a house for the right money and being able to move quickly in the, in the universe of money, you're probably better off. So you've got to look at the renting versus the buying in the totality. And that's another reason why you've got to be very cute about being able to move quickly and being able to um, do those things. Let's just have a look here. Um, let's have a look here. Collaborative approach to what's this one? Um, let me look here. Uh, deal with other would you always push for a more collaborative approach to negotiation rather than a distributive approach, even for one of purchases? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Yes, when I say collaborative, I don't mean roll over and you want to be someone's friend. What I mean is you want to understand this is like a tennis game. OK, this is not a, this is the ball's got to come back to you. And you've got to be very careful about being. Um, and that's from uh, James. Um, James, you've got to be very careful. You've got to be clear what you want. You've got to be clear what your red lines are. You've got to have your options, your information and your patience. And as long as you're open with people and as long as you have a dialogue, which is honest and, and truthful, there's a very good chance you're going to get a good outcome. And here's the thing. If you've got to walk away, it doesn't mean you hate the person or they're a horrible person. It's just one of those things. Right. It's just one of those things. Right. Just before we finish, um, two things I need to do. This book here is absolutely superb. OK, this book here is one of my recommended books. If you want to know more about negotiating, it's called Never Split the Difference. This is from Chris Voss. He is a fantastic guy. Um, he was an ex FBI hostage negotiator. You'll read it in two or three days. It's one of about five or six books on the subject. Highly, highly recommend. You can also get the audio version. Really recommend that. And um, uh, if you have access to the Learn website from Salary Finance, you'll have access to all our box set videos, our guides, tools, calculators, all stuff that we've helped create for you. Um, sadly, on the videos, you've got to watch me talking to you and explain stuff. But, you know, you can look and listen to stuff in your own time. Now, I want to just uh, get a quick uh, uh, sense from you if you think today's been useful. Was it reasonable? Quite useful? Really good? Excellent? Oops. Excellent. So I'm just going to quickly uh, push the, uh, the poll out. And if you can, oops, there we go. Vote away, please. That'd be good because it makes me, gives me a um, couple more seconds. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Great stuff. Well, 
53% quite useful, 35% really good, 10% excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, as I said, I've finished. I've tried to answer those questions. It's been great talking to you. Um, if you've got colleagues who might benefit from listening to this webinar, not only is it going to be recorded and available, but also there's one at 1.30 and there's one at 7.30 tonight. Thank you very much for joining.